No one cared about my opinion when I was a little kid. No one cared what I thought. Sometimes people would say, uh, what do you think you're doing? But that just meant stop. They didn't actually want to know my thought process. They didn't want me to be like, well, I was going to put this bottle rocket into this carton of eggs so that when I lit off the bottle rocket, the eggs would explode everywhere. <laughs> oh, well, that's very interesting. And what brought you to this experiment? Oh, well, thank you for asking. Well, <laughs> you know how I'm filled with rage? <laughs> I'm so horny and angry all the time, and I have no outlet for it, so... Eggs. <laughs> Like, I travel alone sometimes, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll put up with anything. You know? Like, I'll book a ticket on some garbage airline. You know, I don't want to name an actual airline, so let's just make one up. Let's call it, like, Delta Airlines. So I'll book a ticket <laughs> on Delta Airlines. And I'll show up at the airport, and I go, can I get on the plane now, please? And they go, no, it's delayed nine hours. <laughs> and I go, OK and then I go to the bathroom and then I come out of the bathroom and I go any updates and they go yeah we took off while you were in the bathroom because we hate you now take this meal voucher that doesn't work go fetch and I go oh, okay and I go over to the Wolfgang Puck Express and I go can I have a sandwich please and they go no and I go, okay. And they go, you're a little fat girl, aren't you? And I go, no. And they go, say it. And I go, I'm a little fat girl. <laughs> and then I go over to the Delta help desk, which is an oxymoron. And I go, can I please go home on an airplane? And they go, no. In fact, we're going to frame you for murder. <laughs> and you're going to go to jail for 30 years. And I go, why are you doing this to me? And they go, because we're Delta Airlines and life is a fucking nightmare. But with my girlfriend, she would just be like, let's see if Southwest has any flights. So it's better. Town today, I was on West 12th Street. I was downtown. I was walking towards this guy. He's walking towards me. He's on his cell phone. We're both downtown. We're on West 12th. As he walks past me, I hear him say, no, 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 I can't meet right now. I'm way uptown. And then he looked at me and he winked and he kept walking. <laughs> that guy should be declared mayor of New York City. I don't care if he's had a scandal. Automatic mayor. And he probably has if that's how he conducts himself on a day-to-day -day basis. If he's lying about his whereabouts at two o'clock on a Saturday while I high-fiving random guys on the street. I was glad I noticed him. I normally don't notice people. I zone out constantly. Have you ever zoned out for a few minutes? I've been zoned out since 2014. I just, all day long, I wander into traffic, walking like Charlie Chaplin, listening to a podcast while thinking about a different podcast. <laughs> I can zone out anywhere. I was at the doctor's office. He was reading me the results of a blood test. It was important. I listened. And I zoned out. I was like, nah, I'm going to stare at the wall and think my thoughts. I was like, huh. None of the Beatles had mustaches. But then one day, all of them had mustaches. That's weird. I can't think of a time a group has done that. Some people in my life don't want me to zone out as much. They want me to focus, and they want me to be in the moment, and they want me to do this by meditating. I don't know if you've ever tried meditating, but I've been trying it. This is how you meditate, okay? You sit on the floor with your back perfectly straight, which I hate more than ISIS, and then you take deep breaths. I don't like sitting up straight, all right? It's never gonna happen. If meditating was sitting hunched over on the toilet with your elbow on your knee while kind of looking at your phone, I'd be the Dalai Lama. I don't like sitting up straight. So you sit up straight, and you breathe, and this helps you stay in the moment. Don't bother. The moment is mediocre at best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fine. Let's all try right now. Let's all be in the moment in silence right now. Sucked, right? Not fun at all. <laughs> that was boring. You gotta zone out. You have an imagination. You have a movie theater in your brain that plays fake arguments that you win. Uh 
Have you ever just been sitting there thinking about something for like 20, 25 minutes and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I'm driving. And you remember, you're like, I'm going 75 miles an hour. I have been for a while. I could have changed so many lives. Sometimes my wife, I have this wife, she'll be like, are you watching the road? And I'm always like, I am looking through the windshield and I'm not gonna hit anyone. But no, I'm thinking about the Beatles. For years, uh, I was a child. And during that time, I went to a school, right? But I was terrible in school. I was awful at it. My worst subject was math. And in the grade school that I went to, they did this thing one year where they divided all the kids up into two different math groups, right? Based on your abilities. And the first group that you could be in was called the Blue Angels. And it was named after the famous aviators. And the other group was called Group Two. Yeah. Oh, we were a swell bunch of kids in Group Two. Best part of it is, we picked the name ourselves. The teacher was like, what are we gonna call you, Group Two? And we were like, ah, bingo, you got it right there. Four and five is 12. Too anxious for a lot of things. I get very nervous all the time. Not even about like major life things, just like about in everyday situations. Like this is my regular speaking voice, but if I'm in a public bathroom and someone knocks too suddenly on the stall door, I go into a whole different speaking voice, which is, hey, someone's in here. Someone's in here. So if they're going to be like, I think there's a carnival barker in there. I think someone's trying to drum up business for a carnival. I decided to do something about all this anxiety recently. I decided I was going to try and get a Xanax prescription. I don't know if anyone here has ever tried Xanax, but it's fantastic. Very, very muted claps for Xanax. You don't really get woos. It's more like, yeah. I didn't know how to get a Xanax prescription, though. Drugs like that are tricky sometimes. But I talked to a friend of mine, and he said, hey, I did this. He said that he had a regular doctor's appointment, and at the end of it, he said to his doctor, hey, doctor, sometimes I get nervous on airplanes. And the doctor just wrote him a Xanax prescription. And I was like, yeah, that's the type of lowbrow I'm looking for. I'll take your advice, friend I've never listened to before. So I go to a clinic, and I go in, and I'm just going to go in for, you know, a regular type of checkup, and at the end, I'll ask about Xanax. So I get to the front desk, and they have a why are you here sheet. And I want to pick something that will get me in and out really quickly. And I look down, and I see frequent urination. And I was like, perfect. That'll be a super quick visit, you know? I'll just be like, hey, sometimes I pee a lot. And the doctor will be like, me too, crazy, right? And I'll be like, I get nervous on airplanes. So I checked off frequent urination, and I sat down in the waiting area, and I waited for three hours. I finally go back to the observation room, and oh, in the observation room, there is a male nurse standing there, and he has a Batman sticker on his stethoscope, a Batman necklace, and a Batman watch. He was kind of moving around the whole time, you know? He was just like, all right, I am too blessed to be stressed. Let's do it. What are you allergic to besides work? And then he takes something and he'd throw it over his shoulder and be like, beats working. Like all of his jokes were very anti-work, which is not always what you want from a healthcare professional. <laughs> the doctor comes in the room and the doctor looks at my chart and he says, oh, you're here for frequent urination. How many times a day are you urinating? And I tried to think of a number that would warrant a doctor visit. So I said 11. <laughs> and that was too many times to say. The doctor looks at me and says, you're peeing 11 times a day. Then you may have something wrong with your prostate. So what we need to do, well, some of you are ahead of me. So I don't know exactly how he phrased it, but the gist of it was, hey, if this visit is to continue, I'm going to stick part of my hand up your ass. And I didn't know what to say. Because I couldn't be like, no, that's okay. I was lying. It was a lie to get drugs. You know, like a crime. 
So what I did was, I pulled down my pants and I walked over to the observation table and I put my hands down on the observation table like this. And by the way, part of me was like, whatever, you know? <laughs> you know those days when you're like, this might as well happen. <laughs> Adult life is already so goddamn weird. <laughs> so I'm bent over like this on the table and the doctor comes up behind me and goes, no, 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 not on your hands, on your elbows. And he knocks me down like that. And this is so much worse than this. I don't know why, I think it's that this has like a little remaining dignity to it, you know what I mean? This is sort of like, oh, stick it in, I am an American. <laughs> this is like you're leaning over the edge of a cruise ship and you're like, ah, we are approaching Martinique. <laughs> he knocked me down to my elbows. And then he stuck his hand in and you know how sometimes you're like, I bet I know what most things feel like, you know? <laughs> you just think you'll know. I did not know what this was gonna feel like. And this was the actual sound I made. I went, oh! <laughs> but I didn't say it. Like it came from my vocal cords, but it was totally involuntary. It was as if a ghost had been trapped in my belly and finally flew out towards the light. And then, when he pulled his hand out, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. So I will phrase this as delicately as I can. I did not realize that when the doctor pulls his hand out, it feels like you because the only thing that's ever come out of your butt before has been So, he pulls his hand out, and I thought that I was into his hand. So I yelled, I'm sorry! This is a very routine procedure, by the way, for most doctors. And so far he's had to deal with, oh, and I'm sorry. And he didn't even let me off the hook, you know? He wasn't like, ah, oh, don't worry, you didn't into my hand. He just threw his glove away and was like, ah, ah, ah. And I was about to ask about Xanax, but then he said, all right, your prostate's fine, but we still need to do a blood test. So I pulled up my pants and shuffled away feeling different and he yells out into the hall he goes hey we're doing a blood test get in here and batman dances back in and he's like all right we're gonna do a blood test you look different let's do it <laughs> the doctor left the room so i'm alone with batman i just need this blood test to be over okay but first i had to tell batman something i said batman look i'm one of those people who when you take blood from me sometimes i can faint and i was in the waiting area for three hours, and I haven't eaten all day, and I'm really worried I'm gonna faint. And Batman said to me, and I'll never forget it, Psh, you're not gonna faint. So, <laughs> I stick my arm out, Batman puts the needle in, I immediately collapse on the ground. I wake up and I am covered in sweat, lying on the observation table. I wake up, I open my eyes, and I see Batman's face, he's looking at me and he goes, you gotta go! And I said, can I please talk to the doctor though first? Because sometimes I get nervous on airplanes. And Batman said, the doctor's gone. So I got my stuff and I left. The moral of the story is, that if you've been nervous your entire life, you should ask your doctor about Xanax, because if you lie to him, he will stick his finger in your ass. And if you do suffer from frequent urination, keep it to yourself. I went to that clinic two years later for a different checkup, and as I was leaving, who did I run into but Batman? And he smiled at me, and he was wearing reading glasses to show that time had passed. <laughs>
I watch too much crime stuff. I do. Too many crime dramas. I love Law and Order. That is my favorite show on television. I love Law and Order. It's good. I love Law and Order because it's the same episode every single time. Like, it's the same thing again and again, Law and Order is, to the point that, like, you see the same types of characters on every Law and Order. Uh, some of my personal favorites, there is a guy who, while being questioned by homicide detectives, will not stop unloading crates. <laughs> Doesn't matter to this guy. Double rape and murder? Nah. He's gotta unload that van. The detectives will show up with all these serious questions, and this guy is just like, Tony Ramirez? Yeah, I remember him. <laughs> Used to work here Tuesdays, right? It's like, dude, people have died. How often are you questioned by homicide detectives? I love Law and & Order, and I miss Jerry Orbach more than certain dead relatives of mine. He was the best. He was the best. For those of you that don't know who that is, Jerry Orbach, he was a wonderful actor. He played Detective Lenny Briscoe on Law & Order for many, many years. He was also the dad in Dirty Dancing. He's the one that put Baby in the Corner. That's right. He was a wonderful actor, but a couple years ago, he died. Now, you may know that. Or you may not know, and I'm not lying to you, Montreal. I wouldn't do that. After Jerry Orbach died, this is absolutely true, he donated his eyes to the New York Eye Bank. He was an eye donor. So there's these signs all around New York that say, Jerry Orbach gave his heart and soul to the gift of acting and the gift of sight to two New Yorkers. Two New Yorkers got Jerry Orbach's eyes. Sorry, like as a transplant, not just to have, like they got them put in. Sorry. Two different New Yorkers, though. That is fascinating to me because they're two different New Yorkers. They probably don't know each other, right? They're probably strangers. Well, that would make a great movie. <laughs> that would make a great romantic comedy. Oh, I can see the preview now. They're just like, he's an average guy who only likes sports. Dude, you sold your grandmother's wedding ring? What? It was for season tickets. She's a busy businesswoman who only likes business. Ma'am, could you turn off that Bluetooth? We're at a baptism. He's March Madness. <sighs> She's Merrill Lynch. Got it. But they have one thing in common. They both have Jerry Orbach's eyeballs shoved into their face. New Line Cinema presents Love at First Sight. This summer, love is spelled with two eyes. And the scene, I thought a lot about it, thank you. And the scene, where the two, where the guy and the girl finally find each other, because the first act of the movie, they get the eye transplant, that's a given. Rest of the movie, they're walking around New York, but they keep like crisscrossing paths, like in that movie Serendipity, which is not bad. So they're walking around, they're like, oh, when are they finally gonna meet? And here's the scene where they meet, okay? Because if you remember, on Law and Order, whenever Jerry Orbach saw a dead body, he'd make a funny little joke. He'd make a one-liner every single time. So the guy and the girl are coming down the street from opposite ends of the street, all right? And there's an alley in the middle of the street, and there's a teacher lying dead in the alley. And at the same moment, they both go, huh, school's out, and then they lock eyes. It's wrong to make fun of people, you know, but it's so fun sometimes. I've written for some TV shows, and you know, on a major TV show, you have to be careful about what you say about people, because a lot of people can get offended or so it has been explained to me. <laughs> I was once, I'll tell you this, I was writing for an awards show once and I got into some trouble. I wrote a joke for this awards show that had the word midget in it. And someone from the network came down to our offices and he said to me, hey, you can't put the word midget on TV. And I said, I sure would like to. <laughs> and he said, no, midget is as bad as the N word. First off, no. <laughs> No, it's not. 
Do you know how I know it's not, I said to him, is because we're saying the word midget, and we're not even saying what the N-word is. If you're comparing the badness of two words, and you won't even say one of them, and about censorship at all, though, because as you probably have seen by now, you can basically say whatever you want on television. It's ridiculous. You can say anything you want. And if you don't believe me, you should watch a little program called Law and Order Special Victims Unit. <laughs> yeah, a show that I love, because on that show, you can say the grossest things you've ever heard in your life. No, you can't say, like, the F word. You can't say that on Special Victims Unit. But people walk around on SVU going, like, looks like the victim had anal contusions. <laughs> Yo, looks like we found semen and fecal matter in the victim's ear canal. <laughs> Those are two real things that I heard on Law & Order SVU at three in the afternoon. <laughs> Both spoken by Ice-T. <laughs> Ice-T is a detective with the Special Victims Unit. He handles New York's most sensitive cases. <laughs> I love Ice-T on SVU. He is fantastic. He's awesome. What's so great about him is that he's been with the SVU for like mm, 11 years now, but he still treats every case like it's his first in terms of total confusion. <laughs> Sometimes they'll be in the middle of an investigation, and Ice-T will be like, yo, you telling me this dude gets off on little girls with pigtails? <laughs> it's like, yeah, Ice. He's a pedophile. You work in the sex crimes division. You're gonna have to get used to that. You know how they try and tie in, like, current events to every episode of SVU? So there's, there was this episode I saw a while ago that was about sex addiction, because a lot of celebrities had come out as sex addicts. So the episode's about sex addiction. There is a scene in the episode where the other detectives are trying to teach Ice-T what sex addiction is, and it takes a couple of minutes. <laughs> and finally, Ice-T gets it, and they cut to him in this close-up, and he goes, Oh, I get it. You mean like when someone drinks too much? or snorts cocaine, or bets the house on the ponies. And I was like, yeah, you got it, man. <laughs> and I was psyched that Ice-T understood so that they could continue with the investigation. But I could have watched another four hours of Ice-T just naming examples. <laughs> just that close up. And Ice-T like, or like when someone smokes too many cigarettes, or like when someone shops too much with credit cards or like when someone plays too many scratchy lotteries, <laughs> or like when someone eats too much chocolate cake, <laughs> or like when someone eats too much chocolate cake and then barfs it up, and he would just keep talking and it would slowly fade out and say executive producer Dick Wolf. That'd be my ideal episode. That'd be a good one. I also watched this show called Cold Case Files. On Cold Case Files, they solve old murders. And it's really interesting, because what I learned from it is that it was really easy to get away with murder before they knew about DNA. <laughs> it was ridiculously easy. Like, what was even going on back then? What was a murder investigation like in 1935? One cop would just walk in and be like, Detective, we found a pool of the killer's blood in that hallway. And he would just be like, hmm, gross. <laughs> Mop it up. Now then, back to my hunch. Mm, look for clues. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll draw chalk around where the body is. That way we'll know where it was. I saw, a couple years ago, I saw this movie called Public Enemies with Johnny Depp. It was about old bank robbers and stuff. Here's how easy it was to get away with bank robbery back in the 30s. As long as you weren't still there when the police arrived, you had a 99% chance of getting away with it. To the point that, like, those old bank robbers, they take credit for the bank robberies. Like, they come running out of there and they're like, ha, 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 and if anyone asks, you tell them it was Golden Joe and the Suggins gang. And then they, like, shoot Suggins into the side of the wall. It's like, what, were bullets free back then? And they don't even disguise themselves. They dress up for the bank robbery. They're rolling in there in, like, big suits and hats like they're going to church in Atlanta. They make a day of it. 
talked to a lot of people before I got engaged, you know. And I heard this expression about whether or not you should get married. This is an old expression. People say this. They say, uh, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? You ever heard that before? It's a bananas insulting expression. <laughs> to an entire gender. But also, it makes no sense. Why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? You're not allowed to milk a cow that you don't own. That's not even a situation. Was that a problem at one point? Like in the dairy community? Was that happening like a hundred years ago in some village? Some Dutch prick was sneaking in at night being like, ah ha ha, I take your milk. And the farmer was like, well then, this is your cow now. And he was like, no, no proof of purchase. And he ran off into the night. That sounded Dutch, right? You know what that, you know what that expression means? It means why would you marry a woman if she's already having sex with you? Which has nothing to do with what relationships are even like anymore. Now it's like, why buy the cow, question mark? Uh, maybe because every day the cow asks you when you're going to buy it. And... <laughs> You live in a really small apartment with the cow, so you can't avoid that question at all. And also the cow is way better at arguing than you are. And the cow grew up in a family that knows how to argue. Why buy the cow, question mark? Uh, maybe because every time another cow gets bought, you have to go to the sale and you have to sit next to your cow at the sale and your cow looks over at you the entire time like, mm -hmm and does not enjoy the sale at all. Even though she's the one that wanted to go to the sale. And she's especially mad because that farmer and cow met like eight months after you guys met. Why buy the cow? Well, let's be real here. You're very lucky to have the cow that you do have. Uh, roping in cows and getting milk out of them was never anything you were known for, John. By the most liberal of estimates, there have been about eight cows total, several unmilked, and a lot of people think that you like bulls, and if you just but they assume it. When you search your name, the third thing to come up is like, John Mulaney bull, question mark? And if you just bought the cow, nobody would say that anymore. They'll still say it. Because there are those guys who they buy a cow and then on the side, total matador. But, but for real, Chicago, why buy the cow? Let's be real. Why buy the cow? Because you love her. You really do. And yeah, yeah. Sure, she's a bossy little Jew, but... She takes care of you and you don't want to be some old man stumbling around like, Hey, you seen any loose milk? 